Time now for a look at what's happening in our community. Brought to you by Leap Nissan in Cary. You're watching Spectrum News 1. It's 5 o'clock. I'm Rachel Lloyd with your Spectrum News in 90. Some sad news out of Iredell County. Sheriff's Deputy Marty Joe Lewis died after suffering a medical incident while on the job. Lewis served as a school resource officer at Scott's Elementary School in Statesville. No funeral arrangements have been announced at this time. A new inclusive playground at Jackson Park in Hendersonville broke ground earlier today. The project is designed to let children of all ages and developmental needs play together. It's expected to finish next spring as part of the annual Easter egg roll at Jackson Park. And people in the city of Greenville can now sip and stroll in the new social districts. This new rule went into effect Thursday night in the Uptown and Dickinson Avenue social districts. They'll operate Thursdays through Saturdays from 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. So you can be there all night long. Now let's head over to your weather center for your latest forecast. Cooler weather settles in, making for a chilly weekend as we look into the overnight hours. Clear skies diminishing winds. We're down into the low 40s by morning. Plenty of sunshine to warm us to about 50 as we get out the door by afternoon. Near 70 with full sunshine and very light winds. Clear skies and dry air cooling down quickly through the 50s into the evening. Good evening and thanks for spending your weekend here with us on Spectrum News 1. I'm Rachel Lloyd. Let's get straight to the top stories we're following this hour. Friday night, Spectrum News 1 hosted the only debate in North Carolina for the open U.S. Senate seat. Capitol Tonight anchor Tim Boyum moderated the debate between Republican Ted Budd and Democrat Sherry Beasley. The candidates debated the election's biggest issues from inflation to abortion access. The two are vying for the Senate seat that Richard Burr currently holds. Beasley is the former Chief Justice of the North Carolina Supreme Court, and Budd is currently a U.S. representative from North Carolina's 3rd. 13th district. The two were asked about President Joe Biden's recent announcement that he would parole people convicted of simple marijuana possession. I think it's probably outside of his constitutional authority, and I think it sends a very bad message to our children. And why would you want to give amnesty to those who have broken our laws and encourage even more law breaking and encourage even more drugs and perhaps even embolden the cartels even more? I think it's bad all around. They don't want criminals. They want folks who have low levels, low offenses to be able to get back to work. And so I certainly support that. I also know that there's a real opportunity for our farmers to be able to diversify their crops. And so there are a whole host of reasons that legalizing cannabis uh, can work very well here in North Carolina. In our on top of last night's debate between Beasley and Bud, we're also getting to know the other two candidates on the U.S. Senate ballot in North Carolina. Spectrum News 1 political reporter Mary Helen Jones spoke with Libertarian Shannon Bray. Walking into Shannon Bray's home office, one thing is obvious. 
he knows his computers. Well, I mean, I started out in computers when I was eight. Bray works in information technology. He has and has had a variety of clients over his career, from small businesses to the Department of Defense. Anything can happen. Like last week, I was working with clients in Finland, so I'm up at 3 a.m. Um, and you know while everyone else is sleeping so even though I work from home sometimes I still don't see my family as much as I'd like. On top of that he's running for U.S. Senate. Bray is a libertarian. He's one of two third-party candidates on the ballot. His campaign doesn't look like that of Ted Budd and Sherry Beasley. He's mostly using his social media platforms to get his message out. Uh, I try to do as much as I can on Zoom um, because we third party candidates don't have a lot of money to be running around and I also don't have a lot of time. If I started campaigning, I wouldn't be able to make money to pay my, my mortgage. On nights like this, he's able to meet with fellow libertarians. A night of support ahead of November. We're coming together trying to represent ideas and try to find ways to help the American people without trying to overburden them with taxation. His three top issues are fighting inflation through tax reduction, ending the war on drugs, and increasing transparency in the government, like in policy decisions and voting systems. Let's offer some recovery so that everyone can, can get back to where they can take care of themselves and not necessarily put them under burden of basically from the debt of the United States government. When asked how he wants people to think of him, his answer goes to family. I would like to be known as someone who just got tired of seeing everything fall apart and do nothing. And, um, and I want to be kind of remembered, at least by my kids, as someone who stood up uh, for what they thought was right. Another candidate vying for the U.S. Senate seat is Matthew Ho. He's running on the Green Party ticket, and he supports a universal single-payer health care system. He wants to end the war on drugs and is focused on housing issues like rent control and banning banks and corporations from buying single-family homes. Uh, there used to be kids all across the street, but both those homes got bought by corporations, and those families had to move. North Carolina's voter registration deadline is October 14th. Early in-person voting starts six days later on the 20th and runs through November 5th. And Election Day is November 8th. To stay updated on stories we're following, download the Spectrum News app. It's available to download now in the Apple App Store and Google Play. It's been more than a week since Ian tore through southwest Florida and then hit parts of South Carolina and our state. More than 100 people have died in Florida because of the storm. And here in North Carolina, five people were killed in storm-related deaths. James Jarvis, the executive director of the American Red Cross Cape Fear Chapter, is heading to Florida to help with Ian's response. He's one of 30 local Eastern North Carolina Red Cross region responders supporting the hurricane relief efforts. Jarvis will depart from Wilmington on Sunday and he tells us he wanted to give a helping hand to those impacted by the storm. You know, we experienced uh, tremendous damage and destruction here as a result of Hurricanes Matthew and Florence. And when that occurred, there were thousands of people that came here to eastern North Carolina to help us. And so I see this as an opportunity to give back and help those that are suffering down in Florida right now. You're very the largest U.S. hunger relief organization, Feeding America, has been working with FEMA and other charities to assist in the ongoing response to Hurricane Ian. One of its local chapters, Feeding Tampa Bay, has been working around the clock to help those in need of meals. Our Karina Capabianca has more from Washington. Feeding Tampa Bay President and CEO Thomas Mance says it's been a 24-7 operation pre- and post-Hurricane Ian from stocking the shelves before the storm to making prepared meals for those without power. Now, as power is gradually getting restored, the next phase is distributing food items people can use to restock pantries or cook at home. We normally average about uh, 1.5 million meals a week. Uh, this week, we've been over 2.4 million meals. 
uh, as we um, have tried to respond. So it's a significant increase. Luckily, Mance says thousands of people have stepped up to the plate to help out. It's Tampa Warehouse full of volunteers creating care packages. Volunteers have been turning out record numbers. I think it's one of the nice things we see is whenever there's a crisis, people want to help. Feeding America has sent 28 truckloads of relief supplies to areas impacted by Ian. From working with FEMA to other charities and partners, Man says it's been an all-hands-on-deck effort. What we want to do is make sure that there's a coordinated response because the family that needs support needs to know it's going to be there and that it's available. And we work hard, all of us, to make sure that's what happens. You can visit feedingamerica.org to learn how to make a contribution or volunteer. In Washington, Karina Capabianca, Spectrum News. When you see the incredible solid wood belt. Five eleven, and you're back with your weather on the ones. Meteorologist Chris Thompson with you, looking out at Carter Finley Stadium. Uh, activity picking up there. Beautiful blue sky right now, 64 degrees. Dew point 45, a northeast wind at eight. If you're heading out there for the game, uh, bring a jacket. By the time we get to kickoff at eight o'clock, it's going to be 55 degrees. Halftime, it'll be down around 50. By the time you're Searching for your car in the parking lot at the end of the game. It'll be in the upper 40s. Beautiful, perfect football weather indeed. Not a whole lot going on the weather map. That cold front pushed on through. We've got that northerly flow of cooler air. Kept our temperatures from rising too much today. Uh, we'll hold, keep our temperatures in check for tomorrow. We'll warm up maybe a little bit, but we've got a cold morning coming up tomorrow morning. And then we'll, uh, we're going to see things warm up as we head on into the work week. So tonight down to 42 degrees. Winds will uh, be northwest be very light, if any at all. Clear skies. That'll give way to sunshine for Sunday. We're heading up for a high, oh, maybe 69 degrees, still well below where we should be for this time of the year. The average high is 76. Uh, we're going to gradually get there. And by the time we get into Wednesday and Thursday, we'll be back up around where we should be for this time of the year. It's also going to stay dry for a while, at least through midweek. We're not expecting any rain. Looking at a decent chance of showers Thursday into Thursday night. I think we'll dry out, though, in time for Friday. Not good. Uh, opening day of the fair is Thursday. You don't want to have rain on the opening day of the fair. All right, here we go. 42 tonight, 69 tomorrow. We're up to 70 on Monday with, again, with a lot of sunshine. We'll get those morning lows out of the 40s by Tuesday. Another sunny day with a high of 74. We'll take a more detailed look at that seven-day forecast coming up at 21 after the hour. Dozens of neighbors and volunteers gathered in Douglas Park Saturday morning to clean up the old Asheboro community in Greensboro. The event was part of the Safe Street campaign and is sponsored by Guilford for All, the city and other community partners. Residents asked the city to bring in trash trucks to help clear some of the dump sites in that area. Volunteers who helped out say they hope this is only the first step. This is just the beginning. We're going to keep organizing, we're going to do more, and we're going to have more changes. Leadership with Guilford for All says the city has committed to supply more trucks in the next few weeks. National Fire Prevention Week kicks off Sunday with Fire Prevention Day, but local first responders are already celebrating. The Guilford Fire Department hosted a fire prevention fair on West Wendover Avenue Saturday morning. Leadership with the fire department says the event is aimed at teaching fire safety and community building. We want them to know that we are your community helpers, we are your public safety people, and we are here to partner with you to make your life and your, your living day to day as safe as possible. National Fire Prevention Week runs through Saturday, October 15th. Flu season is back, so health experts say it's time to get your annual shot. According to the State Department of Health and Human Services, 
17 people died from the flu last year. That's down considerably from the last season before the COVID-19 pandemic when 196 people died from the flu. The flu and COVID may have similar symptoms but are caused by separate viruses. So if you're vaccinated for COVID and want to be vaccinated against the flu, you still need that flu shot. And pharmacists and pharmacy students around the state are preparing for the upcoming rush in immunizations. Spectrum News 1 reporter Zyneria Bird spoke with pharmacy students who are training to give out flu vaccines this year. We are expected to see a lot more cases here. Kristen Kajinski and Brianna Mamega are heading to their noon pharmacy lab. Their third year pharmacy students at High Point University, their lab is focusing on vaccinations. We're learning more about the COVID vaccine and the flu vaccine. So learning about counseling points, proper hand hygiene, things that you can do to prevent the disease as well as getting your vaccine and preparing for the upcoming flu season. Kajinski got into pharmacy following the footsteps of her older cousin. Being in medicine, just giving back to the community and helping them. And I think that's what drew me really to pharmacy. And Mamega has similar goals. Um, being able to help the community out in ways that they might not be able to get the vaccines is why I do this. Their professor rolls up her sleeve to help the duo sharpen up their skills. So we practice almost every week doing vial transfers and drawing up um, syringes. Which will help them when they start giving flu shots out in the community. Doctors say we've seen some pretty mild flu seasons over the last couple of years due to people following COVID restrictions. But since those restrictions have relaxed, there is some worry that this year could see a rebound. It's been a quick spike in cases. So based on that, in Australia, we want to make sure that we are taking the necessary precautions this upcoming flu season. Meaning it's even more important to get vaccinated this year to stay healthy. Make sure that you're getting your vaccines and you're practicing good um, hygiene. So coughing into your elbow, making sure you're washing your hands often, um, making sure that if you are sick, you either wear a mask or you stay away from people. Sounds like all the precautions you were taking during the pandemic can still apply during flu season and flu season lasts from now through May. This is our magical data we just collected in our mapping mission. A group of North Carolina college students will be soaring through the sky thanks to a federal program. Why the professor leading that program says this is paving the way for the future. Well, back to fall like temperatures after that warm up Thursday and Friday. That cold front came through, really uh, cooled things down, cleared out the air very nicely. A live look from our camera at RDU International. Currently 64 degrees, a northeast wind at 8 miles an hour. Uh, high today in RDU, 67. Yesterday we were in the 80s. Uh, we should be up in the mid 70s. The morning low was 58. We're going to be cooler than that before by the time we get to midnight. In fact, we'll be down to around 58 shortly after sunset. So that is not the low for the day. Fayetteville, high of 72, a morning low of 60. And again, that's not going to be the low for the day. Let's do the tropics and see what Julia's up to. Uh, looking better now that it kind of got away from land over warmer waters. Uh, looking a little better in its satellite presentation. Winds up to 70 miles an hour. Threshold to become a hurricane is 74. It'll probably be there uh, sometime very quickly. Uh, looking for landfall along the Nicaraguan coast uh, overnight uh, as a hurricane. And then uh, models now pretty good agreement about bringing it back out over the Pacific uh, over time. Uh, in held together as an area of low pressure. Again, the models yesterday, we had some bringing it back into the Gulf. It looks like everything pretty much together at this point. All right, for us, cold front came through. Not much happened after that. Beautiful, cool, dry air in place, and that's going to be the case as high pressure builds on in. Very quiet forecast, very dry forecast 
through about midweek, uh, and we'll see a gradual warm up as that high kind of sits over us. We'll lose the, lose the cold air advection, and we'll see, uh, oh, we'll gain a degree or two uh, every day as we move along. But for tonight, it's going to be chilly out there. We're going to see some upper 30s across the northern counties, low 40s into the Triangle, Durham, Sanford, and then some mid 40s across the Sand Hills. We get into the day tomorrow a little bit warmer than today. 65 Roxburgh, 69 for Raleigh, Smithfield. You can expect about 70 degrees, 73 Fayetteville, and into Lumberton. Into that seven day forecast. Here we go, 49 Monday morning, then we're up to 70 on Monday, 74 by Tuesday. So this puts us Oh, pretty close to where we should be at this point. Uh, Wednesday picking up a few clouds there. Uh, later on in the day, I think we'll see an increase in clouds, and you can see the morning low uh, Thursday up because of that cloud cover. Thursday, chance for some showers. That'll stay with us into Thursday night, but it should be gone. And Friday, we should clear out pretty quickly. We'll look for a high of 72 into next weekend, cooling down a bit with a few clouds Saturday looking for a high of 68. The Federal Aviation Administration handpicked UNC Wilmington to join their special unmanned aircraft program, better known as drone classes. Our reporter Rachel Boyd gives us an inside look of what students will learn once classes start. When it comes to Narcisa Precope and her drones, never judge a book by its cover. I've almost stepped on a black mamba and I was almost run over by an elephant one night in a tent and I got attacked by a hyena. So, so mapping with drones in, in wild African environments comes with risks. It was her mapping missions around the globe that made her realize the potential drone training could have on a college campus. I wasn't scared to let them launch the drone and crash it or do anything like that because when students learn, they are engaged and then they want to, to learn and they, they help us push the science and they help us push the applications forward. She brought the first drone to UNCW's campus five years ago. It cost $24,000. I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, drones were not a big, they were not a big thing at the time, so we just learned by doing. If the duct tape holding it together is any indication, this one has seen better days. As I said, this drone has been used by students to <laughs> learn on. And the last student who used it actually landed it in a salt marsh in the water. <laughs> and that was the last time this drone was actually alive. Goodbye. The looks of a drone can be deceiving. And then I'm going to, to fly a mission. I'm going to set up a, um, a grid and I'm going to do a little bit of a mapping project here on campus. It's going to cover essentially um, about 100 by 100 meters and it's going to be completed in about three minutes. Some are tiny right, but mighty. Uh, but this only this small drone and a multi-spectral camera like this that sees beyond the visible part of the spectrum we can actually um, map um, various uh, components of ecosystem change. And others look like they might just blow away in the breeze. <laughs> this drone is actually made out of styrofoam and it is engineered like that on purpose because it makes it light, it's easy and light in flight when it, when it goes. And it's able to, to handle some degree of impact with branches or even upon landing. Her flights these days are much more tame. But the adrenaline rush is still the same. I tell my students sometimes that I'm having mini heart attacks every time I take some of the big drones up in the sky. This technology has revolutionized their industry. I was out in the field with a binder with sheets of paper, with a GPS in hand, with a camera in hand, with a compass around my neck, and then I was relying on satellites, and they would only maybe give us a good image twice a year. The resources at her disposal today were unthinkable even a decade ago. On demand, we can go out with, these, with this equipment and fly and collect the data. All of that can be done with drones now. Because it, you appreciate it even more after struggling to, to find a spot. 
a new way to spotlight Hispanic artists in the Queen City. We're showing you how they're getting noticed when Spectrum News 1 returns. Today's winning lottery numbers are brought to you by the law offices of James Scott Farron. If an accident has left you injured, call on the Hurt Line. 